So yeah, my name's Dave Cormier. I've been around the MOOC thing for a while. And uh, it's a nice opportunity to come in here and present some of the research that, some of the work I've been doing right now. One of the things I'm going to present is ongoing. Actually, both things I'm presenting are ongoing. Um, and really, what I'm hoping to get today is some feedback from you guys. So if you see something that looks weird, or you have questions or thoughts or feelings you'd like to jump in, frankly, the more I hear from you guys, the happier I'm going to be. Because, like I say, there are no finished thoughts up there. Some of the, I'm going to give you a, a brief sort of wander through how I got here. But once we get down to the two pieces, the two work, the pieces of work that I'm doing now, um, I'd love some input on some interesting research questions I can apply to that because uh, I'm still fighting them out with a bunch of people um, and some ideas about the project that Piotr and I are working on too. All right, come on in. So um, I'm going to do this sitting down casually. You guys want to jump in, by all means, go ahead. So <clears throat> broadly speaking, a colleague of mine uh, likes to say this a lot and I think he's right. Um, the MOOC is essentially what the internet does to education. If you go back and you look at the technologies as they match up against education, you know, before the advent of print, if you wanted to learn how to speak, you wanted to learn how to be a good rhetorician, there was one guy on the island of Molin that you could go, Molin on the island of Rhodes, that you could go find. Both Caesar and Cicero both went to be taught by the same guy. The two, was it, I think it was two weeks it took to get from Rome to get there. On one of those trips, Caesar was actually caught by pirates on his way to get there. And that's what you're looking at, right? The technologies just weren't there. The access wasn't there. It was one guy that they were looking for. When you walk forward a little bit and you look at the catechetical nature of the medieval education system, where you have a lot of call and repeat, where you have knowledge that's like there's one copy of this book and in, like inside 500 mile radius. Nobody's touching it, and the only way that anybody's leaving the room with it is to lock it inside their brain. So you have a lot of that. The technology and the, the, the status of where the information is is very much kept in people's brains, and the only way to pass it around is by rote. You come forward again, you get the printing press, you get the textbook, and then all of a sudden we have you know, Pestalozzi's dream of being able to teach an entire country how to read and write in the late 18th century is leveraged on top of this ability of handing them a textbook so that Gertrude, the imaginary mother, can, well, his pictured imaginary mother, could sit down with her child and teach him arithmetic just by starting at the front of the book and moving the pages one after another. That view of education, while incredibly useful for what Pestalozzi was trying to do in the 18th century, to teach a whole country a whole bunch of things, still has a powerful influence on the way that we look at education now, particularly as you see it in the K-12 system which is still very much under the yoke of that evil textbook, which sort of forces everybody into this linear process of learning. When we look at what the Internet allows us to do and some of the things it allows us to leverage, where you can get lots and lots of people, where you can get people from different countries, and the price point is so low that you can actually leverage these things at scale. People can engage. And I really think that the MOOCs are one of those things that, you know, we've been trying to get lots and lots of people together to do this forever. Foucault used to have 2,000 people come into his lectures at the Ecole Secondaire. Um, you know, it's not that these things are brand new, it's that the affordances of the internet provide some really, really interesting pieces. So I'm going to give you a bit of the journey that I followed on. Um, this is my incredibly self-centered history of MOOCs. Um, this is the story from my perspective. Um, I came to this view of education through something called EdTech Talk. Uh, anybody? Anybody? In Texas? There you go. One, two. Uh, in uh, 2004, 2005, a buddy of mine called me up and said, we should do an online webcast thingy about education. And I said, sure, let's do that. That sounds great. And the first day we went out and we talked to ourselves. And the second day we went out and we talked to ourselves. The third day we went out and talked to ourselves. And then a community of people called the Webheads. If you're ever interested in international education and the history of it online, I advise you to go check those guys out. They sort of wandered by en masse to our live webcast, and we started talking to them, and then we started talking to other people. And then we I think the last count, there are five or 6,000 people that are loosely associated with that community, all educators around the world, all with different goals and different ideas. But what I started to realize is as we started coming together, I had my own experience of that community as a practice experience, where you don't know why, 
but when you go home, you seem to know more than you did before. You end up in a meeting and somebody asks a question and you have the answer to it. But there's no outcomes that are associated with that community. It's not what you went into it for. But somehow it seems to be when you get a lot of passionate people together, people start to learn. The problem with that is, it's very, very, very difficult to create community and it's even harder to keep it running. It's also exhausting. So my search, my, my interest in all of this is how do you take, how do you get community-like effects on purpose? How can I point to that thing over there and say, I want to get a whole bunch of people to get together and learn about that thing and I want them to start on Tuesday and I only want to be involved in it for 10 weeks because really I'm going to be exhausted at the end of that 10 weeks and I want to just let it go after that. So for me, that's what I went out looking for. In 2007, George Siemens, everybody, anybody know who George Siemens is? A couple? Some? Anyway, he's a really cool dude, well worth tracking down. Um, George Siemens ran a, a conference online called The Future of Education. And when he ran it, he ran a three-week pre-conference and a three-week post-conference. Not revolutionary. Um, but we got a lot of traffic. We got a lot of conversation going on. And frankly, none of us cared about the conference. The thing we really enjoyed was this six-week thing that happened where we engaged, we talked about the future of education, lots of people we hadn't heard of showed up, people with perspectives that we'd never considered that we couldn't have planned for showed up and we had a really good time. So George and Stephen Downs, some of you may also know, got together that winter and decided they were going to run a course like this in the summer, um, or in the fall of 2008. So that first course called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge a more esoteric topic I can't imagine, um, was something that they ended up doing. They had 25 students at the University of Manitoba. And what they did was they said, okay, we have these 25 students, they're 25 paying students. Well, let's just open the course wide open for everybody else who wants to join. And 2,400 other people joined up, which by current MOOC standards is nobody at all. But at the time was like, what the hell are we going to do with 2,400 students? Um, you know, how are we going to plan for it? What are we going to put them into? Because we were looking for an interactive course. So there's lots of discussion and lots of conversation and stuff. There's no assessment model set up for it, certainly not for the, free, for the people who are, who are signed in. So over the course of that summer, when we were talking our way through this, I ended up saying, it's like a massive open online course, never realizing that I'd be arguing with the New York Times about what the word means three years later. Casual conversation. There's that story in a nutshell. But... There was something really powerful about what happened there, and that's that the obscure little field of connectivism got 2,400 people to all talk about it. Now, frankly, as we all know, that was more like four or 500. You don't get all of those people, right? The arc is different. Not everybody who signs up actually participates. But the content, the, the, the place of that field changed because of that course. The research in that field tripled because of that course. And I made that up. I don't know if it's exactly triple. It was a totally manufactured number. A lot improved, increased. Because again, nobody was measuring this at the time because it never occurred to us was going to happen. Right? It's just that all of those people, all of those professionals engaging with the field had a fundamental impact on what that field was. And there's something really interesting about that to me. Over the next two years, we did four or five others, maybe about 10,000 students total went through them on a variety of topics in education. And by the course of doing this, we start coming up with new ways, trying new ideas. What happens if we run it four weeks? What happens if we run it as we did in 2011, 36 weeks, which I heartily advise nobody to ever consider. It's a terrible idea. That one there, we had 36 different faculty, each teaching one week, one week after another over almost a year is the most exhausting process that I've ever part of. Please never, ever do this again. Uh, it, was, it was terrible. It really was. But that same year, some guy in California uh, ran an AI course and 165,000 people showed up. And then all of a sudden, the idea of a MOOC was interesting to people because the scale was there. Um, and for us, again, really interesting cross-section because what they were after was very different than what we were doing. Um, he was very much trying to teach other people the stuff he knew. And what we were doing was trying to bring people in and have them test what we thought we knew. Right? It's a very different conception of what you can do online. Both totally valid ways of approaching it, but very different. 
Over the next couple of years, you know, we've got Year of the MOOC, uh, MOOC, Death of Education, we're all going to die! Oh my god, we're all going to be saved! Hype cycle, garbage hype cycle, all the way up. Um, started getting calls by random companies who wanted to use MOOCs to save the world, make million dollars, all the rest of this stuff. When frankly, we've all realized at this point that none of those things are going to happen, right? There's some really practical things that you can do. Certainly in India, there, there's a lot of, when we went over there in 2012, they said that the, the government officials that we met with said that they have 500, an additional, additional, that's the key word there, 500 million people they need to train in the next nine years. I don't even know what that word, that number doesn't mean anything to me when it's applied to people, because I'm Canadian, <laughs> right? Like this is a lot of people, you know? But yeah, so I don't know what that means, but I know you're not gonna do it face to face, because there's too many people. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done, but I think we've gone past the point now where the reason we're doing this is because it's new. That part of the hype cycle has passed, so the question for me then, and the question that I'm going to address looking at some of the stuff that I'm doing, is what's in it for me as a facility? Why would I go out and do this? When in, I got asked the question this morning at edX, um, I forget who asked me the question, but somebody said, how do I convince faculty members they want to do this? And frankly, you know, I was talking um, this morning with some of my, my new friends uh, over in, in the Harvard shop about why you would do any of this in the first place and how fun it would be to just go out and do it. Um, I don't know if, I don't want to give away your plan, but uh, you know, we were talking about trying to launch, what, what would happen if you tried to launch a condiment MOOC? So you get a whole bunch of people together trying to make mustard and then take that example and then try to follow it through. How do you build community? How do you get people excited? How does that run out? In my great dream of running a Bob Dylan MOOC where you can get all these, because there's lots and lots of people out there, it'd be really, really fun to do but this is not for credit. This is not doing this stuff for those reasons. They'd be things, be, I'd be doing it because I love it. Or doing it because I'm obsessed with mustard. I don't know. If you're mentioning it, that means you have to help me do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll help. Uh, yeah, just uh, my number is 555. Um, so just a couple more points. Uh, so these, these are the two courses, RISO 14 and Maker Physics. Uh, RISO 14 is the one that won't die, it's a zombie MOOC right now, and I'll explain that in a minute. And the Maker Physics one is the one that Piotr and I are working at with edX, and I'll talk about that too. Um, but this has really been the year where I've started realizing that it's about me, and this is why I call this the selfish reason. So what is it in it for me? Why am I devoting my time to this? I was in six, or I facilitated six, seven, or eight MOOCs before. Exhausting processes, it was neat to figure out the new platform and the new ways of doing this, but I'm past that now, and I think a lot of us are. It's a question of why are we teaching in the first place. It's a good question to ask in our classroom, and it's a great question to ask when we're trying to do these things. I just want to talk about the CMOOCs a little bit further. Um, this is the part of a video that we released in 2010 um, called Success in a MOOC. And these are sort of the ways that we look at the, 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 process, the general process of participating inside of a CMOOC. Um, orient, declare, network, cluster, and focus. The orient part is probably the biggest thing. Because if you're in a disconnected, can, like if you're all wandering all over the internet and people are doing lots of connectivist things, it takes a while to get there. It takes a while to understand what the rules are. You've got a, a negotiation of a social contract there that's really important. The declaration part, uh, and maybe I'll just stop with declaration, is the other part that's really critical. Because for, for a CMOOC to work, people really have to have their own voices. Um, it's not, uh, a facilitator is not creating all this content that you're walking through. Ideally, the community is the curriculum that you're following. So if people don't have voices and they don't have places to speak from, the whole project doesn't work. Because that's what we're in it for, is how can we get this, how can we get these people to share what they know so we can all work better together from that. Um, that, <laughs> I like to throw these up there. Um, it's, um, there are a lot of conventions around education that, that are broken here. We don't have outcomes. Uh, we don't tell people what success looks like. We tell them, hey, success is up to you, uh, which makes a lot of people mad. Uh, this is my boy, Oscar. Uh, they kind of look like that. I imagine them on the other end of the line looking like that. We get a lot of complaints from people going, 
shouldn't you be more organized and shouldn't you be more structured and shouldn't I know what success looks like and I respond of course that I don't know who you are how am I supposed to know what's inside your head how am I supposed to know how this content applies to your experience at the University of Cairo I just don't you're the person who's the authority on that by which I can tell you that the CMOOC has never been successfully applied to a 17 year old um, these are very much things that happen among professionals so far uh, God knows I've tried to do it the other way. As of yet, I have not found a model. We're working towards one that matches up parents with their kids for transitions uh, starting in a couple of weeks. I'll still see how that goes. Uh, but uh, it's very much something that's about people who are already really engaged in the material you're talking about. The last point on that, uh, is anybody familiar with the Kinevin framework? Um, I find this really, really helpful when talking about education because uh, somebody, every time you start talking about crazy concepts of education, somebody will go, well, I didn't learn my timetables that way, and I don't want an airplane built that way because it'll crash. And this, I like to, to bring this out and sort of explain that, you know, some things are in the simple domain. There are things that have direct answers. You can call them facts. Um, we might argue on what is a fact and what isn't. But at some point, you know, there are things that respond to best practice where you, if you put down the best practice, that's going to be a better way of approaching it. And there are things that wander over into the complex realm where we don't really have answers to them. They're not sort of, they're not, sorry, Piotr, I know you hate it when I say this, but they're not things that, that have definitions per se. If we say, you know, what is learning? There's no answer to that question. It's a complex question that we're always going to end up negotiating. And I think the CMOOC works better on those high-level, complex issues. So broadly speaking, a CMOOC is part course, part conference, part community, and really all complexity. So that's really what we're talking about here. Feelings, comments you'd like to throw in, things you'd like to type. Why don't you think teenagers want to do a I mean, we've had them. We've had some of them start. Um, I think that um, one of the things I, I teach teachers educational technology. One of the things I do. <laughs> one. Um, they, I always tell them they have 97% of the things they need to work online. They can already collaborate. They already have professional skills. They know how to be nice to people. They know how to create space so other people can speak. They have a lot of those collaborative things. that, that They know how to work with people, right? It's one of the things you learn as you get older as you become a professional. Um, a lot of those skills simply do not reside. They just they don't have enough life experience, I think, is the biggest issue. Um, I mean, are there exceptional kids who could do it? Oh, of course there are. We've had 16-year-olds in the courses before, just phenomenal. Uh, mostly from uh, underdeveloped countries, actually, is where we get the teenagers from, interestingly. Um, but uh, always a bit nervous when they come in, because you're like, oh my god, a teenager. And then you're like, okay, calm down. <laughs> There's no COPA regulating us here. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's sort of my general, which is why we're trying to match them with their parents this time, to see if that provides some structure to allow them to use to help sort of develop some of those skills. I don't know if it will, but we'll try it out. Anybody else? There's a question. So what, how would you distinguish a CMOOC from a community of practice? Or is a CMOOC a community of practice? I think ideally it would turn into a community of practice. Um, a CMOOC itself, I think of it as a generator for community, not a community in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I think of a community of practice may form or get started because of a CMOOC, but um, I wouldn't call it a community in and of itself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's, to me, it's an engine, like hopefully, and I think it's, it might be happening with this course that I just ran, that I actually have a community for me, which is really exciting. Because I've tried to start many, 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 and I've only succeeded like twice. Well, succeeded in that three years later, you look back and it's still strong kind of way. So maybe you would characterize it as like the initial kind of setting a structure out of which a community of practice. That's right, that's right. You're hosting, um, one of the I wrote an article recently where I, it's like a very long party, where you just invite everybody in and you hope they stay friends. Mm -hmm. you, know? Yeah. you know? Yeah. Go ahead. So what about when the inverse is true? There's already a community of practice. Do you feel that there's value in also creating a CMOOC? I mean, to use your Bob Dylan example, there's a lot of oh, that be awesome. Obsessive Bob Dylan fans out there That's who already have found themselves. Right you know those websites. <laughs> uh, so what? What do you? What could you imagine the, the advantage of a is then there already is a community. Is there not? I, I mean, inevitably what happens is some of the communities come as a whole. So we had 
we've we've had them where you know 150 people will move in and they're all friends already um, and it's almost a challenge to have that group in there because they are so insular because communities develop those inside languages and we have these sort of sunny ideas that communities are positive forces but the truth is is they can be really disruptive forces and they have you know internal ways of speaking and they're more tendent to turn to the people that they know and they can be really disruptive inside of those things so what I've always wanted to do uh, and have yet to, to manage to convince someone to let me do is to take a national organization and to try it. We came this close with a national organization of HR professionals, about 95,000 of them, uh, and try it. Um, I haven't seen anybody do it yet. I will say that the, um, uh, what's the name of the, the course is called Summer of Learning. If you go to summeroflearning.com, it's there. Uh, Aquant is the name of the company. Um, they ran a course for 10,000, they had 10,000 people come into it off their website. Um, and they both have clients and service providers who do programming. And a lot of them knew each other already. But they wanted those people to have HTML5 skills. So what they did is they ran a course for both groups at the same time. So in an existing community, it was very, very successful. Um, and they tried the same thing in 1999 but they flew in 400 people actually to Boston um, and did it face to face when they did the transition last time. And this one, well, 10,000 people, they grew, the brand pushed, it was really successful for them. So I think there's some, some real potential there as well. I think I'm surprised more people haven't taken advantage of it yet. I think once more people see what Aquan did, they'll do it more. Uh, but I think you'll see a lot of it corporate driven because it's really hard for communities to just have the right person there to run it because it's, it requires a fair amount of energy to get started if you're doing it outside of a connection to um, a large nonprofit corporate entity. Um, there was another, hand. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, actually, your answer there kind of touched on my question. I was wondering uh, who has who has been the drivers behind making this thing so far, and who do you see in the future being like this, this role ball? Because, you know, Universities, maybe professional organizations, just pioneers that happen to be more passionate or something better at organizing people than others. I don't have any historical models to base any of those decisions on. I have hopes. My hope is that I can convince other people like me to do them on the things that they love. Um, because I think there's something really great about it. And that's what I'm just about to talk about here is my stuff and the reasons why I would go ahead and do it. So I would love to see more people say, you know, I really love circuits. Um, some people like circuits. <laughs> um, and I would love to talk about this one thing that I know that there are 500 people out there really, really, really want to talk about this. And you set up the structure and you get it going and it's a way to get your research out there. Um, so selfish reason number one, right? Um, do my research for me. And really, uh, pretty successful. My research, does everybody know what this is? I hope none of you know what this is, because it means that you've been near it, and it is the nastiest... Point slime. No, it's worse. It's Japanese knotweed. Um, it is the most invasive, terrible creature. Um, it, uh, when they had it in the ground in London for the 2012 games, they dug down 30 feet below it and 30 feet around it to make sure that it was dead. Okay? Because it's a rhizome, and it's a nasty rhizome -y, growy thingy. And the stuff I do is called rhizomatic learning. That's the educational theory that I, theory, that's a grand word, educational story um, that I've been working on for seven or eight years now. So this course that I'm talking about is about rhizomatic learning. And it's the nature of the rhizome, but particularly as it's talked about by Deleuze and Guattari in 19, well, 1980, in a book called A Thousand Plateau. So all that to explain that we're talking about something fairly esoteric here. You know, I don't got a hundred thousand, I don't have anybody in my hometown who I can go and have coffee with and talk about this with, right? But this is something that I'm super passionate about. These are some of the reasons, some of the, the, the qualities of the rhizome that I think make it a particularly good model for learning. And I, in November of last year, said, I want to run a course on it. Uh, so I called the folks at P2PU. Anybody P2PU people here? Familiar, Familiar with them? Okay. So uh, Vanessa Generali at P2PU, I called her up and I said, look, I want to put a MOOC on your platform, MOOC. I want to put an open course. I don't know if it's going to be a MOOC. I don't know if anybody's going to come because I'm just Dave starting a course on P2PU. It's free. I go in. I log it in. I set up a course. This is from week three. 
and I say, I'm going to start on the 14th of January. We're going to talk about rhizomatic learning. I'll see if anybody signs up, and then we're going to go to the races. I'm hoping, open course, if I get 10 or 15 people to talk to, I'm going to be happy. I figure we had about 500 people register overall, right? These are the, the six weeks of the course. As you can see, um, there were some controversial topics in the course. Uh, week four created a bit of a stir. <laughs> uh, play on the Nicholas Carr there. Is Google making it stupid? Um, but basically, uh, a course entirely constructed to get people to challenge their idea of what education is for, what our place in it is, what our place is in educators. Essentially, everybody who took it was an educator already. Uh, some really impressed, really cool people. So when I talk about outcomes, when we talk about a CMOOC, why are you doing it, what am I getting out of this process, the first thing I got out of it was three more weeks. At the end of the course, the lunatics, self-described, asked for permission to, actually not ask for permission, I'd already made one of them admin on the site, went in and created week seven, then they created week eight, then they created week nine. Right now, the Facebook community is debating the content of week 10. I've totally lost control of it, and they have taken off and they're still going. So I don't even know, like I was reading some of the, the reworked stuff from this. Uh, week eight is actually them reviewing an article I wrote in 2010. I never gave it to them. They went out, found the piece, started debating about it, posted it as a week and are now, it's still going. I, I haven't touched it, right? So for me, having that is one of those signals that the community stuff is happening, right? I'm not involved in the process anymore. They're self-organizing, they're self-creating, and plus, they continue to engage with my work. So if somebody writes a paper that says, I'm gonna critique rhizomatic learning from this perspective, for me, that's like, that's a dream come true. Because if I get, there are another 10 or 15 people writing academic papers, it helps me professionally, but also helps my work go forward, right? And it pushes my work to a new place. So that, that kind of stuff is really exciting for me, particularly when I'm not setting the topics, because then I'm getting new, new kinds of stuff coming in. So I can imagine that one big factor that this can happen is that you have really very filtered people starting at the beginning. The oh, kind of people who totally. you, you can see them doing this outside of this context. And so then the more you spread the idea, more you or someone else makes it easy to start a MOOC, start a C MOOC, you lose some of the filtering effect. Have you thought about is there a sweet spot like how easy do you want to make it so that people coming in still know that there are people here who pay the price to enter? That's right. So here's that's a that's a great question because there's all kinds of pieces around it. They're already talking RISO 15. So they already want to start next year. And I say, great, I'll run it next year in January. Totally fine. Um, but in the feedback for the course, the, one of the themes is that they want different questions next year. They're starting to make demands because they already feel ownership over this. So then the question becomes, how do you ever let new people in? Right? So, and this is the, question, the part about community earlier. Once an inside language starts to form itself, do you continue this or do you start again? And if you start again, Let's say, that, let's say that this becomes huge. I hope it doesn't. Well, I don't know if I hope it doesn't. Let's say it does, and like you say, 30,000 people show up. I have no idea what's gonna happen. I think you're right. I don't think the conversation will be as good. Uh, I think the tools that I'm about to show you that we use to stitch this together will probably blow up, uh, which is the problem with all of this. And those of you who work with big courses know this, is that scale is really challenging. There's always a point at which things start to break. It might be 5,000, it might be 10,000, it might be 100,000. I see a bunch of people smirking. <laughs> you know, and, that, and I think that this model would break at scale too, uh, where you would end up with 15 sub-communities instead of one central one. We had three or four communities, <coughs> but I think you're right. I think it would, get, it would get messy as it got bigger. Interesting too. Anybody else? Um, so... Two research projects started in the middle of this were two groups, one of them an auto a collaborative autoethnography. Yeah, I said it. I can never say that. Um, it's got 20,000 words at this point. There's like 50 people working on it. It's going to publication. It started halfway through the course. Um, there's another group of people who've started a different research uh, agenda um, where they're looking at learner participant relationships. Um, and who knows what else? You know, those are the ones I know about. So 
my research agenda is being pushed forward by the fact that this course started. Again, could I have seen that as an outcome before I started? No idea. But I do know that when you start these things, the, in the range of things that you may want to go to, some of those things start to happen. Now the problem is, is if you're going for funding or you're going for any of those kinds of avenues, very, very difficult to explain to somebody what you're going to end up doing because you don't know. Because in this course, the first two weeks that were described up there were actually part of the original six. Three, four, five, and six I made up during the course because it was clear that the community was going in a different direction. So even the syllabus of the course wasn't the same at the end, let alone the content, right? So the third piece about this is the community part, and it's hard to talk about. In some sense, you've got lots of data that you're talking about. You know, there are 5,000 tweets and thousands of links and all the rest of this stuff. Um, the country stuff. This piece down here, that's a Facebook connection graphy thing. This piece down here, for those of you uh, interested in such things, anybody know Martin Hoxie? <sighs> such great work. Um, this is a little engine that he designed that pulls all the Twitter traffic and shows all the connections in it. So you drop your hashtag in there and then it creates this kind of thing. One of the activities, like I don't, he sent this to us in week two and we designed an activity where everybody was assigned to go out and find a lonely dot and make a line to it. So make a connection, pull somebody in, find somebody who's not part of the, the centralized community and make them part of that community. This ended up becoming a really powerful activity, both from the perspective of finding those people and bring them in, even though some of those were like porn bots, and some of them were like <laughs> companies that were tweeting into the community, but some of them were actually people who had tried to connect, and because of the way that, you know, if you're having three or four, um, like this is the, I know this is kind of a weird picture, but there wasn't an hour during, I thought it was a three or four week period, there was not an hour where a tweet wasn't showing up. It was a really, international nature to the course that you could easily have tweeted at 1256 at that time and gotten swept past and not included in the community. So we did a bunch of things that pulled those things back in and this, um, this engine ended up being really powerful for that. It's a really cool one and if you are interested in such things I heartily advise Hoxie's piece. One of the other things that we noticed and this is from Gordon Lockhart, um, he designed he wrote the Python script at the start of the course to pull in all the comments that were tagged RISO14, put them in one stream and pull in all the... So it was a, an aggregator that he set up for the course. Again, not done by me, but by somebody there. The interesting piece here is the lack of drop-off in the comments. Um, drops off a little, tails a little bit uh, on number of comments there, but the comments per thread uh, stay pretty consistent. Um, which I think is kind of cool and indicative of something happening, indicative of the continuation of the community. These were all distributed. There was no list of all of the blog posts. There was no place where people signed up their blogs. They totally found each other, went out and collaborated in that way. So I think there's some interesting stuff there too. Um, we used Unhangouts. Um, I don't know if there's anybody from the Media Labs, but we used Unhangouts to mix success. Uh, although I noticed when I went to take the screenshot for this that there's new functionality since the last time I was there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this was really neat. If you haven't used it, um, I don't know what the status is for getting involved to play with it. Yeah, you have a create and unhangout button now on the homepage, so you can just request button. Oh, you can request it now from the homepage? Um, if you are interested in having a really sort of flexible collaborative platform, on Hangouts is a really nice way of doing stuff out in the wild. Um, it's still free, I believe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, some really, I was looking for quotes to pull out from the stuff that was there because so much of this is a qualitative response. Um, this one just entertains me. Um, <laughs> I don't know quite what it serves, but I think it speaks to the nature of the way that it works. Um, this is how hard it is to describe what a CMOOC is like. People resort to crazy metaphor to try to explain it to people. And I have a lot of these from different people who otherwise speak in very normal ways. But when you ask them this kind of question, a lot of stuff comes out like this. But the stuff I really like is this kind of stuff. And this is where the real goal of the eMOOC, the, the CMOOC is, is about owning the learning process. Because if the community is actually creating the curriculum, 
then you're responsible, and that responsibility becomes core to the educational process. And I think that that's, that's where the real magic is, and that's where the real community gets formed. Um, this is the logo that was created by the woman from the quote before, and that's the t-shirt that they made and are sending around that apparently I'm getting in the mail in a couple weeks. So you end up with this group of people who got together to learn something, and on the other end, you end up with a membership to a community, which I have those concerns about, but a community of people who actually start talking about their dogs, as well as they're talking about the sort of our shared deep passion for education and sort of new ways of looking at it. So this is a CMOOC, right? And I'm, you can draw the conclusions as to the differentiation between some of the other stuff that's out there. The other selfish reason, oh, let me stop there for a second. I'll just stop there for a second. <sighs> yes? Uh, you mentioned somewhere that um, the participants from the Rhizomatic Learning course, they started creating their own uh, lectures. So I wouldn't say lectures. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> their, their own, yeah. They, they started creating weeks. Yeah, yeah. weeks. So uh, where this discussion was happening, you gave them uh, admin for Somebody asked me in the Facebook group Facebook. to get admin rights to the P2PU so that they could create, um, I don't know how many of you have used P2PU, but there's a badging system in it. And I can't abide badges, but okay. they wanted to create one, so I let them. Okay. And they just used their existing admin rights to go ahead and create new weeks to the course. So they are still happening on P2PU or on Facebook? Still on P2PU. So those three weeks are actually, if you go to P2PU right now, I think it's course 882, if you look for Rhizomatic Learning, you'll see they're negotiating week 10 now. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm curious to hear more about the auto-ethnography piece. Mm. I mean, it's still developing. Um, How did it start? And one of the students just said, hey, you know what we should do? We should do an auto-ethnography on how this all went. And everybody went, yeah, that's a great idea. Seriously, I'm not joking. That's how it went. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had nothing to do with it. Um, I did, we've been in various negotiations about whether or not I should be engaged in it. And I think there's, there's some interesting sort of side research we'll end up doing about the role of the facilitator inside of that kind of autoethnography. I'm worried about it tainting their ethics, to be honest. Um, because as a community group, they're more than welcome to go into that. But once, I, I think I'm almost clouding the situation. Um, but there's that debate, I think. But did they decide that? Was the end of the course? Week five. It was in week five. They started so then in week they five. They started to take their own notes and That's right. To That's right. Home. That's right. And then did they post them and people commented on them? Did each one have a different journal? I mean, I just. Oh, um, what they ended up doing was creating an open Google Doc mm -hmm. and running a series of comments across the top that people jumped into a section and started writing their own reviews to it. I can show it to you. Um, it's an open document. I'm more than happy to show you later on if, if you're interested. Yeah. It's an open document. Yeah. Anybody's allowed to access it. Yeah, because I'm an ethnographer. Oh, well then, wonderful. I'd love to have your feedback. I never thought about it. Frankly, they would love to have your feedback, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So um, you're more than welcome to have the link and, and dive in for yourself. Gotcha. There you go. Look at us building community. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Or chance to you on? That's all good, Catherine. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, so the last thing, uh, I've got about 10 minutes to go. <laughs> i got about 10 minutes to go. And um, I want to talk about the project that Piotr and I are doing. So uh, selfish reason number two, uh, I have a day job. I am uh, responsible, as Piotr alluded to, I'm the project's lead for student relations, which is a nebulous title for a nebulous job. I am responsible for recreating the student relationship to the university at my university in Prince Edward Island. Uh, I manage domestic recruitment, first year advisement, first year success, and a bunch of other different little bits and pieces of the puzzle. And I'm very, very interested in the transition piece between high school and university. I'm very interested in those 17 year olds and seeing what I can do to make them a little bit more prepared to come in. A challenge, I might add, not as often faced by different kinds of institutions. Not all of the students who enter my university are entirely prepared for the academic rigors involved maybe different in some places and certainly some debates that we've had. But we have a lot of challenges and a lot of them aren't ready and a lot of them are coming from schools where they're not getting the kind of teaching that they need to be able to succeed at the next level. So I want to be able to help them. Um, in the midst of one of these conversations on a bus in Madrid, 
I ran into a very cantankerous member of the edX crew. And we started arguing about how this was possible. And I was talking about, oh, CMOOC, sunshine and light, community handshakes. And he's like, that's not going to work for physics. And I said, sure, well, we'll all be friends. And he said, no way, it's not going to happen because that's not how physics works. And we fought about it and argued about it. And after 13 hours of riding, I don't know if it was this exact bus, but one that looked just like this, around and around Madrid, where we would get off the bus, grab a coffee, get back on the bus, fight some more. It's a wonder we never got arrested. This is what we did. We came up with this project where we're going to try to take the elements of the CMOOC and the power of something like edX and with the XMOOCs and blend them together. And that's what we're working on right now. That's the major <coughs> physics. That's the second course that I was talking about. Using MOOCs for transition. Using them not with those 45-year-old, 25-year expert teachers, but with a 17-year-old who doesn't have those literacies, who does not have the experience to engage in this kind of stuff, how do we end up leveraging that kind of stuff? How can we get that done? This is the, I, don't know, I never even checked what slide this was. I picked a random spot. You probably misspelled something there, Peter. So the design of the course is, what we're doing is we've got a pre-course, essentially, where we've invited physics teachers from across North America to come together to design a MOOC collaboratively. So right now we're in the midst of the design phase for this future MOOC that we're running, right? So we sent out an invite, we got, I don't know, 70 or 80 people signed up originally, we've got 30 or 40 people working right now trying to design problems, talking about how to organize it, talking about trying to find a common language for pedagogy, um, which is a big challenge. Um, Pyotr and I, for instance, do not agree on the definition of the word constructive. Um, there's been a lot of debate. We've come to the point where we've acknowledged that every time we say the word, we have to say, in the meaning that's associated with X, but that's a lot of the challenge between the two, the two poles, is about finding that common language. And it, in this case, we have a goal that, that we're passionate about. We have something we're trying to get to, something that I actually think is really important, something that could help a lot of people. Um, it certainly helped me get my work done, which again, it's all about me, right? Um, but by the people, by those physics teachers, for those physics students so that they can do those transitions. Um, what we're finding, but what if we built an engine that allowed you to take a test, a diagnostic test, and then had integrated with that the strategies that would allow you to get there? Now, let's leave aside the fact that I don't like the way we teach first year physics in a lot of places. I don't think it should be rote learning. I don't like that approach. That's the reality for 95% of the physics students anywhere in North America. So if we can build this diagnostic test that you can take in grade 11, take in grade 12, take in grade 10, makes no difference to me, that has the remediation strategies built in, then we've got a use of an X move by taking a collaborative community of people to build this thing, meet every year, do it over and over again, to build this other X move that we can run and offer out to lots of people and hopefully be able to provide the stuff that they need. Essentially, what you end up with is a network textbook. You end up with this replacing, potentially, some of those in-class textbooks with something that has a lot more functionality and has a lot more ability to, to integrate a variety of different um, problem types and all that physics stuff that, frankly, I don't understand because I don't know anything about physics. Don't tell anybody. But he does. So that network textbook and getting that access, giving that, that work done where we have those seven, like five or six hundred <coughs> PEI students who are coming to university, getting them more prepared and using this not only to work for PEI, but to work for, frankly, anywhere. Um, to me, a really nice usage of that community and a really nice reason for us to come together and work on that. And I guess the model for both of them where, where they all come together is that, and this is another slide from uh, Vanessa Generali from, from P2PU, is that if you look at this as a process, and we're engaged in the, the long, lifelong learning, forever process of education, that's where the MOOCs become really, really interesting, when we're never finishing. Thanks. <laughs>